Invested in Conversation brings us together with those who know firsthand how community issues are playing out on the ground. In this series, our guests speak from their own experience, lift up their community's grassroots solutions, and share their ideas for building and bolstering a more equitable and resilient region. Over this past pandemic year, we've seen clear evidence of COVID-19's devastating and disproportionate toll on communities lacking access to regular preventive health care, many of them communities of color. Essential workers living in these communities and serving others around our region have been at substantial risk, and they and their neighbors often face this threat without proper information or protective gear. We took an in-depth look at some of these issues in our October 2020 Invested feature. Now we speak with Lashira Lash Nolan to continue the conversation. Nolan is a medical student and the president of her Harvard Medical School class, the first documented Black woman to hold that position. Her vision for a more equitable future of health care centers on community-informed care and an interdisciplinary approach to the health inequities that communities of color and lower-income communities face. She is among those leading the call for changes in our systems of care to directly address the racism and inequities that impact our communities, our workforce, and our economy. Her initiative, We Got Us, is a prime example of this leadership. It's a thoughtful and proactive approach to sharing accurate, culturally sensitive information about the COVID-19 vaccine with communities of color. In this conversation, we ask, what can we learn from the impacts of this pandemic about the underlying root causes of deep health inequities in our communities? And how can the systems that influence health outcomes change to better serve and support these communities? Welcome to Invested in Conversation. I'm Gabriela Kiranza from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. I'm the managing editor for the Regional and Community Outreach Team. I'm here today, I'm very excited to be here today with Lashira Nolan, also known as Lash. Uh, Lash, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Great. Um, so we asked you here today, we wanted to um, follow up on our last conversations in um, the last issue of Invested that we did, which was a look at the intersection of the pandemic and the movement for social justice around Black lives. Um, and we, we did that back in October. We did those interviews back in July. So it's been quite a while and we've had quite a year. Um, so we wanted to bring you on because you're doing such amazing work in this space and uh, wanted to talk a little bit about your efforts around the COVID vaccine, but also just your experience in this last year, sort of being in medical school and medical practice and, and just being able to help the community in the way that you are. Um, so if we could just start with a little bit about you. Can you tell me sort of how you got into medicine? What made you want to go into this field? Yeah, well, once again, I just want to say thank you for having me. And I feel like my journey to medicine started in the third grade. Um, I was um, eight years old and won the science fair at Ambler Elementary School. And that's when I first was like, oh, yeah, this science thing is pretty cool. Um, and then that year I dressed up as a doctor for Halloween. And from that moment forward, whenever folks ask me, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a doctor. Um, and it was so interesting because I was the first person in my family to ever um, go into the sciences to say that they were interested in going into medicine. And growing up, I didn't really see any black doctors or doctors that looked like me. In fact, I didn't meet a black doctor until my second year of college. As I got older and I started to learn more about things like the idea of social determinants of health and how lack of access to opportunities in our society that really fall along the lines of inequity based off of racist policy, how that then influences health outcomes. And when I went to Loyola Marymount University, I was a health and human sciences major. And a lot of what we did was study the intersection between public health, um, anatomy and physiology and social justice. And I think that all of those experiences kind of came together for me. And I think that that little girl that wanted to become a doctor just because it was cool and fun, slowly but surely started to become this, this woman who wanted to be a person with and for others and understanding that the healing that I wanted to do would have to extend further beyond just the clinic because my patients were presenting or were going to be presenting to me with burdens that that were greater than just what you can address in the clinical setting. So you're in medical school, you're you're in this um, 
situation that we're all in right now with this pandemic, uh, that must be quite a wake up call for a medical student in particular. But also, I wonder if, you know, it's been what kind of year it's been for you, um, just being both a medical student, but also a black woman in medicine and, and sort of seeing how this there's been these disparate impacts across communities from COVID and that those disparate impacts are based on long, long histories of disparate impacts and disparate illness across the community. How has this been for you? How has it been as a, as a year of medicine? As someone who identifies as um, an advocate and someone who believes strongly in, in equity and justice, I felt like this pandemic, even at the very beginning, I knew that it was going to exacerbate all of the inequities that existed in our society far before this pandemic. A perfect example of when us students were being told that we should evacuate and leave campus, the security guards and the janitors and all of the folks who were identified, that, that was the first time I actually heard the term essential worker when I was speaking with someone who was a custodial worker. And he was telling me about how um, I was, I was telling him like, Hey, like we're all leaving because this coronavirus is something serious. And he was just like, Oh, well, we're considered essential workers. And, you know, even if it storms, like we're still expected to come to work. And I was like, really? And I could just tell that he wasn't as in tune with the gravity and the severity of COVID-19 in this situation and how it was going to impact his family. So that kind of got me thinking about who, who are the essential workers in our society and who are going to be those folks who are going to be forced to go to work in order to keep our society going. And then thinking about accessibility to information about the vaccine, about the severity of, of this pandemic. And all those things just kind of pushed me to start writing. And I, and I wrote a piece for Health Affairs and it was called Custodial Staff Protect Us During the Coronavirus Pandemic, But Who's Protecting Them? And I thought about my grandfather, who's a truck driver. And I wrote a piece um, for WBUR and I, and I talked about how he, as a truck driver, is expected to transport these material that people are standing in line at different grocery stores and taking up all the supplies. So he's delivering the toilet paper that everyone's hoarding but who's, who's gonna leave him with the supplies that he needs to survive this pandemic as well? We say that essential workers are essential now, but what happens when everything's quote unquote back to normal? Are we still gonna fight to make sure that these individuals have paid leave? Are we gonna fight to make sure these individuals have the opportunity to get the vaccine, right? Like we now have a vaccine, but you have to spend like almost five hours to just get an appointment as it stands right now because of the digital divide and because of challenges with the rollout. So I think that all of those things are conversations that we need to continue to have to protect our essential workers and do the work to make sure that they aren't just essential in the moment when we need them, but they're essential forever because it is quite true that our society would not be able to exist or run without them. There's a lot of important conversations that we have to have beyond just those small one-off changes, no matter how powerful those changes are. Um, so I'm hoping that this can really be something that goes beyond just this moment. So it seems like part of that conversation also needs to be giving people the time and space that they need in those appointments. First of all, giving people access to those appointments to begin with, but then once they have them, giving them the time to talk about, you know, where their hesitancies might be, what they're concerned about in a medical setting. And it feels like we have a system that's not really designed for that. So how important are those conversations to sort of help people feel like they're being heard and then deliver on actually hearing them by responding to their actual concerns and giving them the care they need? Yeah, I mean, I feel like number one, we have to make sure that we're having conversations with our community members. We got to make sure that in every single thing that we do, that we sense for community. Like, I don't think that any decision should ever be made for a community without including them in the initial conversation, in the conversation that you have in the middle, and the conversation that you have on in, in the end, right? So I think that that's something that's going to be absolutely critical. And I think that um, I think that the medical institution has to be genuine about acknowledging the ways that it has harmed traditionally marginalized people in our country, right? So I think that we can't just say, oh, Tuskegee, that happened a long time ago, or we can't say, oh, Henrietta Lacks, such a bad example of, of how we, we didn't act in, in an ethical way. It's like, no, what are the things that are happening today, right? So you need to, to acknowledge what's happened in the past and, and 
and fix and rectify the ways that those same forms of oppression continue to exist in our very everyday lives, right? Um, and I think that that hasn't been done yet. At least I haven't seen it been done in, a, in an intentional way. And I think that that's going to be really key if, if we want to create a space where people want to actively come and, and be healed in our spaces, right? Because right now they're not healing spaces, they're oppressive spaces. So naturally people aren't going to want to enter them. You are doing this incredible work around the vaccine to try to help sort of ease this entry into, into the vaccine conversation, remove some barriers so that people really get the information that they need around the vaccine and can make an informed decision about whether it's right for them. Um, tell me a little bit about We Got Us, why you started it and, and what it does. There needs to be a way for us to have intentional conversations about the vaccine, make sure that our co communities are getting their questions answered, making sure that they feel heard, and making sure that we're doing more than just putting pictures of Black people on TV getting the vaccine and thinking that's enough to make sure that people feel like they know enough to feel like this is something that's for them. So that's kind of where We Got Us came from. And the name is about really like the Black community um, is creating information for us by us. And we're going to help get ourselves out of this pandemic. And it's really what we're about is, is it's all about empowerment through education. So we are putting together um, empowerment sessions virtually, um, and these are available across the nation. So any group, church, school can go to our website and request for our um, education and curriculum team to come and do a one hour presentation where we talk about medical racism, COVID and the vaccine. And we do like a round table of questions and answers. And it's really this healing space where it's not about us trying to convince you. Like our, our one of our pillars is to convey, not convince, because we're not trying to convince folks to get the vaccine, but rather we want to empower them with the tools, statistics, and knowledge that they need to make the best decision for themselves. Uh, we're also partnering with the Boston Public Health Commission to do in-person outreach here in our, in our home of, of Boston. Uh, we're also working with Brockton as well, um, doing uh, community engagement events with them. So I think that Really what We Got Us is all about is, is bringing together our community and creating intentional spaces for us to, to talk about this vaccine and to support one another as we make this decision because it's gonna be absolutely critical that folks have this education and they, they, they deserve to have that information and space to deliberate because it's not just about hesitancy but really just taking the time to make the best decision for yourself. And I think that on the government side and on the leadership side, we need to make sure that once those individuals decide, yes, I wanna get the vaccine, that they have access to it. And we've seen with the way that this vaccine has been rolled out so far, that there have been extreme challenges in transportation, in figuring out whether or not you're even eligible, uh, figuring out how to sign up to get the vaccine, um, access to Wi-Fi, language accessibility. There's just so many things that haven't been addressed. So before we start pointing fingers and saying, oh, you're vaccine hesitant, how about we make sure that you have access to the vaccine? And I think that's also what We Got Us is trying to do is after we give you that empowerment session and we give you the facts and the tools that you need, making sure that you have the, the know-how and the next steps to actually get you vaccinated. So that's what we're all about. And we have a team of over um, 40 students um, who are pre-medical and medical students all across uh, Massachusetts um, from 10 different institutions. We're working with um, high school youth as well to create um, vaccine education projects for high school students and youth activists. So we're really trying to make this an, an all encompassing project in combination with our, with our over uh, 15 community partners and, and that number is growing as well. So really trying to make a, a grassroots commitment to educating and informing our communities about this vaccine. It's such an amazing undertaking and it's, it's so exciting that you all are doing that. It strikes me, though, that, you know, this is an effort that you all are doing as a group of students of color who are leading this effort in the middle of all the other work you're doing as medical students, as you know, college students, as high school students. Um, does it frustrate you that you still have to do this work? And does it frustrate you that you all as students of color sort of had to take this upon yourselves to do something like this, even though part of the, the beautiful thing about We Got Us is that it's for us, by us, as you say, but you know, that, that burden, that, that sort of double burden on you all feels like a lot. Um, so how are you sort of grappling with that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for acknowledging that. Um, because I think that sometimes people will say like, wow, like Lash is writing so many different op-eds and, and Lash is doing um, so much amazing community work. And it's all work that is deeply important to me. And, and these are all my passions. But I think that it is true. Like I'm in my second year of medical school at Harvard. And right now I'm on my clinical rotations. So while most of my classmates, they come home and they'll spend, you know, three hours studying for whatever rotation they're on. I'm coming home studying for whatever rotation that I'm on. And then I'm also, you know, basically putting together a nonprofit and a national campaign to help vaccinate and, and educate my community. Right. And I think that that is something that shouldn't be just the burden of those who are marginalized and oppressed, but it really should be on everyone to think about how can we come together and, and, and hold this burden together. Like, I think that um, it's, it's, it is a privilege to not have to worry about these things. And when I thought about starting We Got Us, and the reason why I just kind of hopped up and just started like messaging people like, hey, do you have any grants or funding for something like this? Um, in that moment, I was like, do I really have time for this? Because I'm on my clinical rotations. It's supposed to be about me and my medical education. But I knew that I wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing that I didn't do everything in my power to make sure that my community was protected. And I think that that's really what it came down to for me. And to not have those thoughts and to not have that, that extra layer of burden is an extreme amount of privilege that I think that folks need to, to sit with and recognize and do what they can to make sure that those who are doing the work feel supported. For, for us to really address the social determinants of health, we know that so much of health is dictated not just by genetics of what goes on in your body, but also the air you breathe, where you live, the kind of food you have access to, whether you have transportation nearby, what your stress level is, all of those things. Um, which is, you know, those are, those are other fields of study. Do you feel like there should be maybe more overlap or different kinds of overlap with other fields um, for medical students so that they really have a better understanding of that? And maybe also some kind of community work that's genuine community work where they're really being part of the community that they're serving. Um, I don't know how much of that already happens in medical school. I'm sure there is some of it, but, but do you think there should be more? What kinds of things would make it more rich? Interdisciplinary is always the way to go. Um, like I wish that I could like learn from law students. Um, I wish that I could learn from social work students. Um, I wish that I talked and interfaced more with students at the public health school. I wish I learned more from uh, folks who are at the divinity school, people who are at the design school, because we could literally reimagine healthcare. Like we can think about how can we work together to make sure that if my patient comes in, and they are undocumented, not only am I going to make sure that I treat whatever challenges that they're having with their health, but also making sure that um, if, if they need legal advice and support, I get that for them too. So I think that there are such unique ways that we can kind of reimagine that and do some amazing work there. And then the design school, like, okay, like how do we design our clinics and our spaces to make sure that they are welcoming and and kind of like give a, a healing and loving vibe when our patients come into our spaces. So I think that there's so many cool ways that we can kind of come together and think about those things. And I think that learning from the way that they approach their fields and approach medicine and health will be so phenomenal. Um, and I think that as far as like getting involved in the community, I think Engagement is like a longitudinal relationship where you're actually building relationships with the community, where you're actually trying to figure out how can we continue to make this work? How can I support you and you help me better support you? And I think that if we can get medical schools to move more toward that, I think it would be so beneficial um, for us as a profession, but then especially for the community, because I think that when you go in, you do your thing and you come back out, is really damaging, right? Because people can start to depend on you. And when you leave, there's that support for them. And then additionally, it just kind of like reinforces this idea that you really don't care about me. You just did this to, to make yourself feel good. Or you just did this because you wanted to get published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, and to show this disparity. And then you just left. And I think that um, when we have a culture of medicine that doesn't incentivize real community solutions, because once you publish the paper, you're good. You got to move on to the next 
publication like that, that publisher parish mentality is really damaging and it doesn't serve our community. So I think that reimagining healthcare in that way through interdisciplinary work and also thinking about incentivizing and creating um, more opportunities for community engagement would be extremely powerful. One thing that you and I have talked about before is, is this concept of dignified medical mistrust and how communities that have been so harmed in the past by health systems, by medical education, um, and by systems around those, those systems, right? So things that intersect with health. When we think about that being a legacy of you know 400 plus years, are you hopeful about that improving, that changing, about building that kind of trust? What kinds of things do people need to be doing to help bring people into the system in a way that they feel heard and respected and trust that they're going to get the care that they need? Yeah, I mean, around hope, um, I feel like we're moving in in the right direction. Um, But I definitely feel like we're going to be in a space where we're we're just going to, I feel like we're going to need to heal ourselves. Like, I think if we continue to wait for all these institutions to wake up and, and finally start to value Black lives, for example, um, I think that there are going to be a lot of Black folks who are going to continue to suffer. And I think that that is why, like, We Got Us will start it, right? Because it was like, if we wait for these institutions to wake up and finally understand that their public health strategies were not working, that's already, like, you know, 5% of our community that didn't get vaccinated because they didn't feel comfortable. They didn't have the information that they needed, right? So I think that really what it's going to take is is us increasing the the pipeline of people of color, people of marginalized identities going into medicine. But I also think that takes a long time, right? So in, in the meantime, we have to try to figure out how can we come together and start healing ourselves? How can we start democratizing information about what are the questions you need to ask when you go into your ob guy appointment and you're a Black woman? How do you advocate for yourself when you're giving birth and you feel like you have a blood clot and no one is listening to you? If we wait for that next awakening, I fear that we're going to continue to see the, the, the suffering, the disparate suffering that we've seen all these years. Well, Lash, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Um, It's so important. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I look forward to checking out the other conversations that you all be having with people. And um, yeah, I just hope that this this work continues beyond um, these conversations that we and then we continue to to commit to doing the work of anti-racism and promoting social justice. So I feel honored and privileged to have been able to be a part of this. And um, thank you so much for doing this. And thank you all for joining us for Invested in Conversation. I'm Gabriela Carenza. We'll see you next time.